on Larry King now, Thomas Middleditch. What's inherent about improv is it is complete discovery. It requires a different comedy brain than your setup punchline stand-up. So into improv, what is it like to be in a scripted show? <clears throat> Hell, oh, shackles, Larry, I tell you, <laughs> shackles. Well, we had T.J. Miller on the show the day it was announced that he was leaving. Did his departure come as a surprise? Mm -mm. No. He gave a candid interview to The Hollywood Reporter, and he was critical of you and then praising of you. Well, that sounds about right. I don't know. Would you call him a friend? Uh, probably not now, but I don't wish him any ill will. I mentioned Medieval Times earlier. I've been five times, and twice uh, my night is one. So that's, you know, less than half odds, but I that's think your that's pretty good. That's your proudest accomplishment? 100%. <laughs> I don't even have to think. Plus, is there something you long believed to be true and realized wasn't? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> that's so deep. I know, too Larry, deep. dude, that's so deep yeah. right now. All next on Larry King Now. Our guest today is the Emmy-nominated and Critics' Choice award-winning comedian, actor, writer, and the star of the acclaimed HBO series Silicon Valley, Thomas Middleditch. I love that name. <laughs> Thomas is also known for Joshi, Search Party, and Wolf of Wall Street. The fifth season of Silicon Valley airs Sundays at 10 p.m. on HBO. On the show, you are in the midst of building a new decentralized internet. Who comes up with these things? The writers? <laughs> the writers, but it's all based on, you know, their meetings when they go up to San Francisco and talk to various... Oh, so it's based on some reality. Yeah, yeah, it's all th theoretical stuff or daydreamy stuff of things that, you know, entrepreneurs would like to have happen. Is it true that your character, Richard Hendricks, was written with you in mind? Yes, as far as I know. Yeah, I was working on a, um, an animated show with Mike Judge, and he works with these two creators called John Altshuler and Dave Krinsky, and when I was working on the animated show, they were saying, hey, you know, we're writing this show with about computer dorks <laughs> for HBO, and we think you'd be great for the lead. And I was like, okay. Uh, a, thank you for the stereotype, but B, like, yeah, right, that would be my dream, you know? That's like bucket list to be on a show for HBO. But it turns out they weren't lying. And uh, yeah, the script, the Richard was called Thomas Pickering, which was my mom's maiden name, which I had told them about. Did you age. think it would be a hit? No, I never think anything I do is going to be a hit. Uh, the, track, the track record of my work <laughs> proves that. Um, but no, uh, even during it, I was looking for some, some reason that I could tell myself how it was going to fail. But uh, it turns out people like it. He's a bumbling character, right? Yeah. But this year, I understand he's ruthless. Uh, a little bit, yeah. I mean, Richard's got to make some some tough calls, and I think he pushes back a little bit. You know, for four seasons, he's been ever the victim, kind of, ever the recipient of other people's bullying, and I think he's kind of, he's not having it anymore. Is Mike Judge easy to work for? He's incredibly easy to work for. Really? I thought, you know, maybe with his success and money and all this kind of stuff, you know, so many people turn into jerks in that yeah. aspect, but no, he's been, he's super nice and encouraging and funny, and yeah, he's great. Well, we had T.J. Miller on the show the day it was announced that he was leaving. Yeah. Did his departure come as a surprise? Mm-mm. No, I think for a while. He was making it pretty clear that he was ready to move on, and um, no sense in... He gave a candid interview to The Hollywood Reporter, and he was critical of you and then praising of you. How did you react to that? That sounds about right. I don't know. That sounds about, I've known that guy for a very long time, and um, I think he and I have had our times where we're very much in sync and times where we're, we're not, and, you know. Would you call him a friend? Uh, probably not now, but I don't wish him any ill will. I mean, I hope he does great in whatever he wants to do, but... Um, were you shocked when he said that? Yeah, I would say so it, was, uh, it was unexpected that he took it that far, but at the same time, uh, what are you going to do? I, I, don't, I, I suppose you can't go through this business entirely on skates, so if someone wants to throw your name under the bus, that's, what are you going to do? I don't want to retaliate. Again, at the same time, I just I hope he does great. What's filled with crazier people? Comedy people or Silicon Valley people? <laughs> 
Are they uh, Silicon Valley people a little off the bend? It's, I mean, it's not that they're like a little off the bend. It's, well, like Facebook is a pretty great example. You've got this guy like Mark Zuckerberg, who's an, an, an introvert, uh, a programmer, someone who wants to build this great thing. And they think it's amazing. And by the end, it's ballooned into this massive data harvesting thing that other people can manipulate and weaponize against society as a whole. All he wanted to do was build this cool thing, and he didn't have, and who could have, the foresight that in inevitably becomes this thing that could be debated as something totally terrible. Um, that's how a lot of people are. They just want to build the cool thing, and they don't realize that people, humans, are <laughs> inherently nefarious <laughs> and can use their cool thing for, for evil. You do a one-hour improvised show based on a single story every month in Los Angeles. Uh, how many, tell me how it works. Well, there's a few shows I do, um, but yeah, I mean, I've been doing improv for, I guess, about 15 years now. Oh, no, like 20, I think. Um, but. Uh, Essentially, the show I'm, I think you may be talking about is the Improvised Shakespeare Company. So not only do we do it, do we do a whole play, we do it in the, the styles, the languages, and, and the theme of the immortal bard, William Shakespeare. So essentially... And off the top of your head? Yeah. What about the show you do with Ben Schwartz? Oh yeah, me and Ben will just take a word, just a suggestion of anything, and then yeah, we'll do about an hour, hour and a half. Give me an improv. example. Well, like you'll say, I'll say, hey, can I get a suggestion? And you'll say, what? Pot Potato Boys or something stupid, right? Or maybe it might be a loaded suggestion, like what was your favorite memory growing up? You know, you'll tell us. And then we'll just take that and let that inspire a show. So essentially we'll be doing scenes, we'll be playing characters and letting your suggestion influence where the show goes. But it's all completely made up on the spot. That's a nervous way to work, isn't it? A little bit, but part of the nervousness is like the excitement, I would say. I find, you know, I got into theater through, um, Theater, you know, I got in live performance through theater, and one of the things that I didn't like by the end is the rehearsal, the repetition, and stuff. And you have to find your the fun within that. And I, I understand that, but what's inherent about improv is is complete discovery at every moment. Great comics have not done it. It requires a different comedy brain than your setup punchline stand-up comedy brain. Like it's less it's less comedy math. Than, than other forms. It's more like you know the rules, then you forget the rules, then you play but by the rules. But there are rules that you don't know where it's going. Yes. Yeah, you don't, don't. know where, No, you don't know where it's going. You want, there are rules like, r rules in improv are more like philosophy. Like the biggest one is yes and. That is to say, something that you say within this scene, I agree with and I contribute. S so that you can build something, right? And there's a lot of little philosophies like that, but again, it's like when you end up doing it a long time, they are suggestions as opposed to, oh, if you break that rule, we have to stop the scene. Do all improv really good at it can work together with anyone? Most of you the time, You can go yeah. in a room with two new improv people and do improv. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I could do it with, with, with greenhorns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> although improv is one of these um, uh, comedy mediums that, you are dependent on the people that you work with. So if I'm, if someone's throwing out some nuanced moves and the other person is maybe not attuned to picking them up, it might be a little bit. Ben Schwartz was here. He's very good. Very good. <laughs> very funny. Funnier than me. Our guest is Silicon Valley star Thomas Middleditch. I love the name. We're discussing the Canucks' path to comedy and how he's taken to fame after the break. Stay with us. Back with the star of Silicon Valley, Thomas Middleditch. I love that name. You're Canadian. Your parents are British. Correct. Is, you think that gives you a different comedic sensibility? Uh, maybe. I mean, uh, my, I, I love the Monty Python movies growing up. <laughs> uh, my parents, my mom in particular, was very fond of doing accents and voices and all that. And uh, Kids in the Hall, a Canadian show, which I feel is very British-inspired, was a huge influence for me. So. The humor is different, isn't it? A little bit, yeah. It's like there's a fondness for absurdity and character, I think. You auditioned for Saturday Night Live and didn't make it, is that true? That's correct. That's correct, sir. Are you here to shame me? No. 
No, you're gonna just... rub it in my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it it got close, but it didn't it didn't happen. Um, it, it, it was it was. They regret a... it. They regret it. Oh, maybe now I don't know. Maybe one day I'll host. That would be a dream too. That would be a nice idea. Put in a good word with Lauren Williams. Has it been true that Silicon Valley was your breakout role? 100%. Yeah. I mean, I had some stuff before, you know, bigger parts and smaller movies, smaller parts and bigger movies, commercial work, but Silicon Valley really changed the game for me, for sure. Does that make it now different when you do improv? Because everybody knows you. <laughs> yeah, I was talking about that the other day. Like, you kind of go on stage already, already having won, in a way. Like, you, gone are the days for the most part, gone are the days where you walk on stage and you're like, okay, I gotta win everybody over because they don't know me. I have to essentially introduce them to me. And then maybe we can get to some fun stuff. Um, it's part of like, the, I guess, the easy bit that comes with a, even a modicum of fame like what I'm The other hand, Bob Hope said when you're well known, you got a couple minutes. Oh yeah, oh you can lose them. <laughs> <laughs> you can lose you them. Don't, you don't own them. No, no, exactly. It's it, it's a different thing. Whereas like before, you got to win them, and then now you got to lose them. Which I plan on losing uh, <laughs> every single night I perform comedy. It's a great honor to lose the audience. Does comedy come easy? It must come easy to you. In some respects, sure. I mean, I always find comedy comes easy, just dependent on what's surrounding you. You can find out that you're doing really well in a particular scenario with your friends on stage. And then other nights you're like, why is this so hard? Why do I suck right now? You know, or why is it such an effort in order to get there? Some nights it's effortless. Some nights you're, you're hitting home runs from behind your back. And other, other nights, you know, I'm trying Being to come up with a solid baseball. So coach. into improv, what is it like to be in a scripted show? <clears throat> Hell. Oh, shackles, Larry, I tell you. <laughs> shackles. Um, no, it's great. Well, look, Silicon Valley, for example, uh, has scripted. scripted, but incredible writers. I mean, the writing staff, it's led by uh, Alec Berg and Mike Judge. I mean, Alec Berg's a Seinfeld, Larry David guy. So you laugh at the readings? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very, it's very clever. And not only is, is, are the jokes clever, uh, the story's interwoven. So really improvising too great would kind of botch what they've done. You so want to run your own show someday? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'd like. I'm, you know, I'm pitching shows left and right, and I'm making it to air. But you know, one day. You are pitching shows. Yeah, sure. How long will Silicon Valley run? I don't know. I think we've maybe got one or two more seasons. That's the big debate. Um, you'd have to get the uh, the higher ups uh, in front of you to get a more solid answer. But definitely one more, and then we'll see how much story is left to tell. But it's still fun to do. It's a joy to do. It's the greatest job I've ever had. Up next with Thomas, we'll talk about strange jobs, physical comedy, even talking to animals. What you thinking about that? <laughs> More with the Silicon Valley star right after the break. We'll be right back. Back with Thomas Middleditch. What a name. He, the fifth season of Silicon Valley airs Sundays at 10 p.m. on HBO. You've been praised a lot for your physical comedy. And, of course, Chevy Chase we think of in that vein. <laughs> yeah. Why do we laugh at people like Charlie Chaplin yeah. who fall down? Well, I think failure in a way is inherently funny. It's why, it's why even as a comedian who I appreciate just, you know, every element of a finely crafted joke, I still watch like America's Funniest Home Videos and laugh till I die. Because like a kid is riding a bike and he falls, he falls. into a bush. And, it's something where you want to see pain, but know that the person's not seriously injured. You want to see them aspire to something good and fail and struggle doing it, or lose their mind and lose their temper and get angry, you know, in some way. Like there's a, there's entire YouTube channels of like sons just trolling their dads, you know, like pranking them in any way possible. And I love that stuff. The line between Funny and Chaplin once said, Yeah. Funny is a guy who's a little tipsy drunk at the top of the stairs and he starts to trip. Yeah. And he hits the first step and the second step and he looks a little weird and you're laughing. Are you sure? On the fourth step, blood comes out. Yeah. And you stop laughing. <laughs> yeah. Very close. Yeah, it's very close and it all depends on where you're at, I think, as a society. I mean, there's probably a, a, a version out there that is, that goes far, that goes gory, that goes to that next level. But if you've crafted it, if you've escalated it there to the right moment, and if what has come before it in space and time has allowed you to get there, it could be funny as well. Have you gotten hurt? 
Uh, nothing serious, but yeah, sometimes I've gone home with some bruised knees and cuts and whatnot. Well, we play a little game of If You Only Knew. Okay. What's the secret talent? Uh, insomnia. <laughs> That's a talent. <laughs> Guilty pleasure. Oh, um, I'm a, just a total door. I'm, I play video games too much. Yeah, that's not you even do? that funny. You do? Children yeah. do that. I know, and I'm a grown man. I also go to medieval times and go to renaissance fairs, Larry. I need help. I have the same yes, interests of a 12-year-old boy. Person you trade places with for a day. Any, any leading member of the Flat Earth Society. Next. Comedian you trade places with for a day. <laughs> Jeff Dunham. Who? <laughs> He's a puppet guy. <laughs> <laughs> Strangest job you ever had. Um, strangest job I ever had. I worked on a cruise ship for about four months. Doing? Yeah, comedy with the Second City. Uh, they had a deal with Norwegian Cruise Lines, and it well, was. Why was it strange? Because you are you are trapped at sea on a floating luxury hotel, but it's a prison because you can't escape. Um, you're there for a long time. You go. You alternate between like fun, loneliness. Boredom, camaraderie. Uh, Can you enjoy nice the pleasures like... of the cruise? Can you sit and have dinner when the then they dine? Actually, yeah. Well, as as uh, the status that we were as that type of entertainer, yeah, we could do kind of almost anything except you know get caught being cheeky with the passengers or doing drugs or something like that. But couldn't date one of the passengers. You could date the crew, and you could I mean date a passenger, but <laughs> yeah, I, I leave okay. that leave that ashore. You know, this is a family show. What what keeps you up at night, Thomas? Um, the world, the environment. If you could speak to an animal, <laughs> what animal would you choose? Uh, I have two dogs, but one dog in particular. Her name is Meatloaf. She's a miniature pincher, and she's covered in loose skin. Loose skin? Yeah, she's just got a lot of skin, you know. And she's very lethargic, and I just want to know what she's all about, you know. Don't you wonder what dogs think? Yeah, yeah. I wonder what they think. I wonder if it's like an up where they're just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they have a simple way of talking, or if when you're like, hey, Meatloaf, what's on your mind? And she's just like, I wonder if... Space like, space do they really like expensive. being petted? They have to, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't offer it up so easily. Yeah. I mean, my dog, I get home, he's like showing me not only his belly, but he's showing me his, like, his junk. Proudest accomplishment. I mean, I mentioned Medieval Times earlier. You know, the Medieval... Yeah. Uh, dinner and tournament. I've been five times and twice uh, my night is one. So that's, you know, less than half odds, but I that's think that's your pretty proudest good. accomplishment? Uh, 100%. <laughs> I don't even have to think. What never fails to make you laugh? I kind of already talked about it. Just <laughs> bloopers, essentially. I found a good um, account on Instagram that just shows ski, ski bloopers called Jerry of the Day. And it's like... People who screw up. Yeah. yeah. Something you wish you were better at. Comedy. <laughs> Favorite video game of all time. <laughs> I feel so known, Larry. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> mm, so many to choose from. If you had only one video game to play the rest of oh, your life, what Larry. would it be? Oh, but it changes every year because there's the new ones. What's the out. current one? Oh, uh, this is the best part about talking about video games is the titles are so absurd. Get this, this is the one I'm playing lately. What is? Warhammer Vermintide 2. I couldn't sound more like a dweebazoid by saying that. I'm sure my 10 year old would like it. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Weirdest fan encounter. I always think the weird ones are um, hey, can I get a picture with you? And after it's done, saying now, like, who are you? Where do I know you? <laughs> and being like, why did you take the photo if you don't know what is happening? <laughs> what annoys you? That. <laughs> the aforementioned thing. Favorite thing about Hollywood? Um, you get to meet the people that you look up to, that you, inf yeah. that you were influenced by. I've met most of the kids in the Hallcats, and they've all been super nice, and that was uh, just to just shake their hand and say, you have no, like, I'm here because of you. It's just, it's an honor. Least favorite thing about Hollywood? The worry, I suppose. Um, the meetings? I mean, well, the man, my manager always reminds me to run my own race, essentially. If we're all doing our own thing, I tend to have my head on a swivel and look at other people in their lanes and say, oh, they're up there, there. Well, I, you know, just the panic and the anxiety, I think, is the toughest thing. Is there something you long believed to be true and realize wasn't? 
<laughs> I don't know how to answer. <laughs> that's so deep. I know, too deep. Larry, dude, that's so deep yeah. right now. Tell me something people don't know about you. Let's see. Oh, then I'm a pilot. I'm a private pilot. Really? Yeah. Fly what type of aircraft? I fly currently. I fly Bonanza A36. Twin engine? It's a single, but it's a cabin class. You see, six seats. Uh, do you fly a lot? I try to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this business, as you know, it's filled with moments. You ever of get a near accident? Only, you know, only when I'm six o'clock high and I gotta turn and burn, you know, I go guns, 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 because, you know, Jerry's coming over the cliffs of Dover and I gotta defend it. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. You like it up there? I love it up there. I love the rules and the regulations. I love going from A to B. I love, you know, America, North America as a whole is filled with a ton of small general aviation airports. And you can go, you can fly right into Zion National Park and yeah. see, see. How that. far can your plane go? Oh, it goes about seven, eight hundred miles before I have to fill up. Thomas will answer your social media questions and question social media in our final <laughs> segment. Plus, we'll discuss his work in the upcoming Godzilla Inst. Godzilla. Oh, my God. More after this. <laughs> We're back with Thomas Middleditch. Don't forget Silicon Valley. It airs Sundays at 10 p.m. on HBO. It's in its fifth season. You recently deleted your Facebook account. You said over privacy concerns. What were your concerns? Uh, Facebook and Twitter. I deleted Facebook mainly because I wasn't using it. Um, it was just sort of sitting there collecting my data. And I think recent stories have proven that that's exactly the case. Um, it's sort of my, uh, I don't know, my private objection to the collection of data and aggregation of the internet as a whole. I don't think, I, I have no need for Facebook and I have really no need for Twitter. I think Twitter has been weaponized just like the former and it's filled with bots and people who push trends and I honestly don't think um, Donald Trump, which is someone that I, pers I personally d disagree with, I understand, MAGA, I get it, don't worry, um, but he, I don't think he'd be president president without without Twitter. And, and what do you make of the Cambridge Analytical stamp? It's a bummer, but to be honest, if anyone's shocked, I think they should pay more attention. So nothing's private anymore? Not really. I mean, the moment you sign up to things, you're consenting to their terms. Um, who reads the user agreements? I don't. I think you should just ex you should just assume that your data is being collected, and if there's any option to tick no on stuff, you, you should. Or just unsubscribe. A lot of people don't realize. You just don't have to do it. You don't need Twitter, trust me. I've gotten rid of it, and I don't miss it at all. In fact, I'm a lot more peaceful. We have some social media questions. Seth Gable, which Silicon Valley co-star makes you break up? Uh, they all do. Uh, Zach particularly throws some real curveballs that get, make me giggle. Also, Jimmy O. Yang, the guy who plays Jin Yang in it, he was saying some stuff earlier this season. I could not get through a scene from him. He was trying to explain to me that he was looking for a dead body to like replace Ehrlich and he kept saying, so I went, I'm gonna do a terrible Chinese accent right now, but he was like, I went to find a, a, a dead white cadaver and I, for some reason, I don't know, maybe I'm just like latently racist or something, I just like him telling me he just wanted to get a dead white cadaver, I couldn't get through it. I couldn't get through it. For me, sounds, something that just is something that sounds weird will usually tickle me like nothing Do else. any people ad-lib in script? Everybody does. Yeah, we're all trying to find a little Do they moment. ever use some of it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're trying to find moments or jokes as opposed to rewrite anything. Tammy Harrison, when was the last time you bombed on stage? Do you fixate on it after the fact? Yeah, I'll usually stew. Uh, I guess the last time was um, uh, probably last year at a college. I didn't bomb. It just sort of like, it was pretty meh. You know, I was doing stand-up and it was old material and I wasn't excited about it anyway. And then I walked off stage and was like, I had zero right to be excited about it in the first place. <laughs> it's pretty stale. And especially when Kamal went on afterwards and just destroyed and you're like, yeah, that's what good comedy is. Uh, you stew over it for a night and then you try to get over it. There are some elements, there were some things that were really scarring. Like I, I hosted this thing called BlizzCon, it's a video game thing. And it was live streamed across the globe. So you get people 
that are witness that are witnessing it on their computer and they be like English as a second language and they don't hear the audience laughter they just hear a joke that like ends in silence because the audience isn't mic'd so they're like what is this and then they go online and get really mad that was that was the trouble when improv bombs improv bombs yeah you know a good group they will notice that things aren't necessarily hitting and they will be able to craft something and pick it up and elevate it again and then when the show's done they'll say oh interesting it sort of took a different energy there but hey we got it back sometimes you can't um, and usually you know you with improv if it's even if it's a good group that doesn't do so well you kind of leave the stage being like oh that was like eating a meal of popcorn like it tasted good but at the end you're like I feel sick of it because I just ate a pound of popcorn Amanda Thompson what has surprised you the most to learn about the real Silicon Valley just that there is an idea for everything every little every little facet of a society someone is trying to crack and hack and make more efficient and create an app or an application or a tool or a thing for that everyone's trying to hack everything <laughs> including the human body there's lots of supplements to make We're almost out of time tell me about oh, Godzilla Godzilla is a giant lizard monster well, who, do you who comes play? from the sea I play a communications liaison who, 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 who to the agency that monitors the monsters serious role it's one of the most serious roles I've ever done did you really get into it? As much as I could. I grew a beard. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to my guest, Thomas Middleditch. The fifth season of Silicon Valley airs Sundays at 10 p.m. on HBO. You can always find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.